Right, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great that uh, uh, Ted's and Hughes Math can uh, celebrating of Ted's and Hughes Mathematics can bring us together to this very nice conference. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's my third time in, in Singapore. I always get the same weather. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about Polish equivalent, Pol Polishable equivalence relations. This is a new class of equivalence relations. Uh, well, the motivation maybe comes from thinking about something called E1 dichotomy. It's probably safer to not put it on the slides officially. I'll, I'll just talk about it on the board. It's, it's a conjectural dichotomy. Uh, about this, is, this has to do with equivalence relations. So E is an equivalent relation on some Polish space, and conjecturally, two things are supposed to, one of, of two things is supposed to happen. Either there is an equivalence relation E1 that Borel reduces to E. That's, a, that's sort of a bad, this is a scary equivalence relation. It's a bad side, this one. Or, and I will not say what E1 is because uh, I mean, it won't matter for the talk. Or something good is supposed to happen. So E is supposed to be structurally nice in some way. And there's two versions of it. Uh, one is that E is idealistic. That's the original version. And the other one, the other version is that it Borel reduces to a Polish group action. So, uh, so this comes out of thinking about this side. I may perhaps... To make a, any progress on this, on this conjecture, maybe try to find uh, partial results. Uh, one, one reason we are stuck maybe is that these are not quite the right notions here. That the uh, idealist, this is, uh, the problem with this, well, where would G come from? Where would you get this sort of abstract Borel reduction? So you would rather want something structural about E rather than just relating it to some other equivalence relation that has nice structural properties. This is something like that. But it's very weak. This is something rather weak. So it doesn't seem, it, it seems like we need something, the guess should be something stronger than idealistic. So uh, what I want to talk about is maybe a, a right guess on this side. Uh, one thing that should come out of it, it's not just that it should have nicer structural properties. So idealistic, I'll, I'll actually have the definition on, on the slides. It, uh, it, it assigns sigma ideals to equivalence classes of each equivalent, of, of an equivalence relation in some, in some uniform way. The polishable equivalence relations, I will try to make it as concrete as, as possible without running into contradictions. So I would like this assignment of ideals to be as global or uniform as is, as is possible. And one, one would also hope that uh, clarifying these issues, we can then have conditions on E that would allow us to prove partial results. So we, no, this is normally stated. I mean, there is nothing wrong with stating it for analytics. Just people maybe... Uh, it's, it's safer to say it for Borel equivalence relations. But one would maybe want to, to have subclasses and uh, for which this can be checked. And uh, so these subclasses can be maybe isolated if we have a better picture of this side. What we should also demand from this side is that a, a, an equivalence relation here, so that's why this seems too weak, an equivalence relation here should admit an analysis. We should be able to, up, to approximate it from above with simpler and somehow structurally sound equivalence relations. So something like, it's not, uh, I have a version, I, I, some time ago I proved a special case of the E1 dichotomy. And the main point in, in the proof there, when you prove the dichotomy is you run a certain procedure, try hoping to, to prove this side. And then when it fails, you flip and you prove that E1 embeds. So one would hope that this procedure, 
that I, I ran for the special class that would, this would be, one would like to have a general procedure that one can run for uh, equivalence relations that are more general than in, in the special case that I proved some time ago. So this procedure turns out to be related to SCOD analysis. It's, it's like, in, in a sense, it's a SCOD analysis of an equivalence relation. And uh, Andrenis will talk about, uh, in the afternoon, of SCOD analysis for continuous model theory. So this, this is something that generalizes that, uh, what, I, what I will talk about. Uh, it's, it's, it's less concrete, but it's more general. It's, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it also covers uh, Polish group actions. Okay, so so this is the, the this will not come up really, but uh, in the talk, because it's just about about this definition and running this code analysis. So I want to first say what's the what is the uh, what are these polishable sub, uh, equivalence relations? Then there are some already defined classes uh, that I want to talk about and the relationship. Then I want to explain what the Scott analysis it is. It's, it will be a, 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 an algorithm, a procedure that approximates our equivalence relation with, a sim, with simpler ones. I will talk about Scott analysis, other Scott analysis. So one is uh, from the paper by Doha, Nis, uh, Tsankov, and Benyakov. Uh, but there is another one. So these are questions for now. The, the, there is one that uh, comes from my paper, from this one dichotomy. And there is also work by Greg Horth on SCOD analysis for actions of Polish groups, so in our class. But there also should be an, a, a, a relationship between, between what is defined here and what he, he did. And then in the last point, I will talk about uh, uh, the proof. So a little bit about the proof. Uh, and this has, this may actually, this, this might be the least technical part of the talk, the, this, this part about the, maybe there's something wrong with it, but, so it's, it's, I, th I think it's, uh, it's something that is interesting in its own right. It's something, general topology, it's qu I was quite surprised that things like this came up. General topology, things like paracompactness, metrizability, connecting with descriptive set theory, done in non-separable spaces by necessity, which is, uh, I found interesting. So let, let me start. So what are these polishable equivalence relations? So before I even uh, do the definitions, let me just recall some standard <coughs> definitions from topology. So a uniformity. So we have topology, topological spaces. Important here will be uniform spaces. So uniformity is just a, a notion of closeness, uh, of being close on, uh, on a set. So formally speaking, a uniformity is a family of subsets of the, of the X cross X, uh, these subsets are symmetric. All of them contain the diagonal, and their intersection is the diagonal. And the most important condition is this one here, that if I p take any, uh, any element of the, dia of, the, of the uniformity, I will find another one that's smaller, such that when I compose this other one with itself, so this is, a, a, W is viewed here as a relation on X, a binary relation, so I can compose it with itself, yes? Uh, so when I do that, I end up inside of V. So this is a uniformity notion from the 30s. Uh, each uniformity induces a topology, so uh, uh, topology is, is uh, how is this topology defined? I take an element, so what are, I have to tell you what are the neighborhoods, the neighborhoods of a point X. You take all the elements of the uniformity and you take vertical section of this element of the uniformity at X. These are now subsets, all these VXs, because V contains the diagonal, all the VXs contain the point X and they form, we treat them as the basis of a topology. One can check that the, the topology is generated by them. These sets are not all open. They are not all open neighborhoods of, of X, but they all contain X in their interior with respect to the topology they define. Right? They, there is no hope that they are all open because V is closed upwards. V contains horrible sets, right? So the sections cannot be, one cannot hope that the sections are open. So this is how the topology is defined. Essentially, every, I mean, uh, completely regular spaces, if you have a completely regular space, there is a uniformity that gives the topology. But the uniformity re remembers much more information about the space. It's a different category, and we will care about uniformities. We will not 
topologies will play a role, but uniformities will be uh, what's, what's important, really. And then there is a theorem of A, that uh, very nice theorem that says that if I have uh, I look at this topology, it's metrizable precisely when this uniformity has a countable basis. So countable basis just means there's a countable family of sets that every subset, every set in V contains one of the countably many. Uh, did I mention also V is closed under taking finite intersection? Maybe I missed that. V is closed under finite intersections. Uh, yeah, so it's called also finite intersections. I forgot about that. So this uh, theorem of A is, uh, this, if you are, uh, know berkov kakutani theorem about topological groups, this was proved a year before that, and th this is essentially like the right, it's the same proof, it's, but it's the right kind of version of that, of that theorem. So, okay, so this is the, uh, this. Uh, so now, uh, what will be happening on, on the space on which the equivalence relation is defined is there will be three objects there. There will be a topology. This will be this Polish topology that we start with, sigma. There will be a uniformity on it. And also, there will be a group of transformations. This group of transformations eventually will make it countable. Uh, and they will interact with each other. So I want to set it up so that uh, I don't have, I'll just have one word for the whole setup. We'll call sigma, v, and gamma compatible if they respect each other. So there is, this, all, all these conditions are uh, essentially always satisfied, easy to check. So uh, what's happening is that the topology given by the uniformity, uniformity we think of something to be reached, so it's something at the infinity. So the topology generated by it is huge. It will be a non-separable separable topology in all uh, reasonable cases. So this sigma, this initial Polish topology, is included in this, this topology at the end. Functions in gamma, they should respect sigma, so they should be sigma continuous. Uh, by sigma continuous, I, I mean continuous with respect to sigma, not, some, not anything else, uh, continuous with respect to sigma. And functions in gamma should, be, should respect the uniformity. So they should be uniform with respect to, with respect, this is a standard notion of being uniform, it's like being, being uniformly continuous. So uh, this just means that uh, f minus one cross f minus one of v is in the uniformity if V is in uniformity. So this is like being uniformly continuous. Uh, so these functions are, and, uh, and then there is a, so these conditions are simply pairwise, these objects interact with each other as they should. Sigma with V, gamma with sigma, and gamma with V. And there is a very important fourth condition that makes things work. So this is uh, what, uh, what I call that gamma is V locally dense. So this is an important condition. This, I will have to explain that this is not, not always trivially fulfilled. So what is locally dense? OK, so I have an element uh, of the uniformity, and I have an element gamma, uh, g of gamma. And I want to say what, what it means that gamma is less than or equal to v. I think this is probably a standard notion. This just means that at every point x, if I act by g on x, I stay within the x section of v. So what it means is v gives you a no, uh, v tells you how uh, that, so if a pair x, y is in v, this means x, y, pair x, y in v, this means x, y in v, this means x and y are v closed. So, and this is the same as saying x is in the, x, uh, v, x, y is in the x section of v. So this just means that g does not move Every point is moved by G very v, v, v close. So v, G does not do crazy things. It just stays local. So gamma is V locally dense if the following thing happens. If I have a, an element of the uniformity, I can find another element of uniform, uh, uniformity, much smaller, with the following property. I look only at G's that respect V in the sense that they don't move points farther away from themselves as V tells it. So I only use at, at, uh, look at points in gamma, elements of gamma that do not do, uh, just move locally. And then I look at, 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 a, at, a, at a point, I look at uh, what points I get from X using such Gs. And they have to turn out to be dense in this smaller neighborhood. 
So what's happening here is this. I have a, at the point x, I have this uniformly given um, vx. I only look at g's that respect it. And they should, the images of x should turn out to be dense in some wx. Also, a no, a uniformly given neighborhood of x. So this is some kind of a notion like a remnant of openness of the action. Okay, is, is that uh, okay? So this is uh, so this is this is a crucial property there that, that makes uh, makes things work. Okay. So now to the definition. If I have uh, I have an equivalent relation on a Polish space x sigma. Okay, so when I want to call it uh, polishable, so what, what, what has to happen is this, that I should have Polish topology given on each equivalence class, there should be a Polish topology. This will give us a notion of smallness, maybe meagerness with respect to this Polish topology. Now, um, this, uh, of course, I don't want to assign the Polish topology separately to each, each equivalence class, so I want it to be assigned as uniformly as possible. So what do I need? I need completeness and I need separability. And then completeness on each orbit will be witnessed by a uniformity. So I will have a uniformity on the whole space. It will give me a topology. This topology will be complete. And each equivalence uh, class will be a G delta with respect to this complete topology. This will guarantee that each equivalence class is a, is a, is a, is a, is a complete metric space. And now, I also need to guarantee separability. How will this be guaranteed? I will have a countable group acting on the, on the space. And for every point, I will look at the orbit of the point. That's a countable set. I will require that it is dense in the equivalence class of the point that I, I, I started with. So this will give me a uniform way of saying all orbits are, are, are separable. So this gives me comp uh, completeness and separability on each orbit, so it gives me po uh, uh, Polishness. Aha, uh -huh. so I was born Polish, but this is not my inversion, this, this Polish ability. This, is, this comes from, this terminology is due to Keckley's and Louvain, not for equivalence relations, but for groups. This is a, 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 an extension of, that, uh, of, the, of this, of this uh, notion. Okay, so so uh, so I have uh, I have a, uh, an equivalence relation. I will call it polishable if there is a uh, there are witness for it, namely uh, a uniformity v and the group gamma of transformations. They are compatible, just like I said. So they respect each other, and there is this local den local density condition. And then for each x, uh, my topology given by uh, by the uniformity is completely metrizable. And each equivalence class of X is G delta with respect to this huge topology at infinity. So this guarantees that this equivalence class, when I restrict the topology to it, is going to be, the topology will be complete. Gamma will be countable. And if I take any X, I look at the orbit of, of, of X with respect to gamma. It will be included in the equivalence class of X. And it will be dense with respect to this topology at infinity, T of V dense. So these two together, oh, I don't have that. So these, these two points together, I said, guarantee that uh, uh, each equivalence class carries a canonical Polish topology. This Polish topology will be stronger than the topology uh, restrictions of sigma to it. Okay, so that's the definition. All right, so what, what can be done with it and how does it compare with other classes? So uh, let's talk about the, there's, two, there's two, two types of classes. Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. So larger classes of equivalence relations. So the, the first one that I need to really address is the idealistic ones, because that's how we started. So this, is, uh, this notion is due to Keckley's and Louvaux, 90, it's kind of some time ago already. So what, uh, what, what are idealistic equivalence relations? These are simply equivalence relations that are uh, with the property that to each equivalence class, I assign a sigma ideal of subset on that equivalence class, and I require that this is uh, it's non-trivial. So the whole class cannot be small with respect to the sigma ideal. Now, this assignment is required to be Borel on Borel. You cannot just do it uh, sort of arbitrarily. So 
uh, what, what must happen, what they require is if I have a subset of the products X cross X, cross X I can run the following test. I can, this is in the product. So I can take a, a, a point X here, take a vertical section of A, look at what trace it leaves on the equivalence class of X and ask, is this in the ideal that is given on that equivalence class? So this answers yes or no, and I collect all the X's for which the answer is yes. This should be Borel. Yeah, this, 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 this is some, it's sometimes called Borel on Borel. Okay, and then, uh, so for example, they proved one of the things that they proved is that E1 does not reduce to an idealistic equivalence relation. So you cannot have an overlap here. You cannot have an overlap here. Ideal, actually, idealistic equivalence relation showed up recently. There was a work by uh, Kekris and McDonald. Very nice work on applications of uh, Tarski's uh, cardinal algebras to, to, to Borel equivalence relations, to idealistic equivalence relations. So they showed up uh, also in recent work. Okay, so it turns out, this is, sort, this is really a theorem. If E is a polishable equivalence relation, that is Borel, so that's important, Borel, then E is idealistic. This Borelness here is enter into checking that uh, the, uh, the assignment of, of ideal is Borel on Borel. So it would seem that this is obvious because you simply have, you have Polish, Polish, Polish topologies on each equivalence class. You just assign meager set to equivalence class, the meager sets with respect to the Polish topology on the, on the equivalence class. But then you have a problem with Borel on Borel. So actually, the way that this, pr this proof goes is you run what I will later describe. You run this Scott analysis. And because the equivalence relation is Borel, the Scott analysis stop, stops. And you use uh, for this assignment not the original topologies that were given in the definition, but the, the, the topologies that are given by the Scott analysis. And then you get this. So, but, so the idea is, is, is indeed the, the standard idea, just assign to an equivalence class meager sets with respect to the Polish topology that's on it, but one has to uh, modify the, 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 one has to run the Scott analysis to get the right Polish topologies. Okay, so now there's also recent work of Alvarez and Lopez Candel. No, Alvarez, Lopez, and Candel. Uh, uh, and then, so what it is, is they, they looked actually at what they called, this was just a, sort of a side issue there, but they did look at equivalent, they called them uniform equivalence relations. So they look at a pair equivalence relation and a uniformity on a set X, and the equivalence relation was uniform if E was an element of the uniformity. And then they had other conditions there that actually uh, implied that the equivalence relation is pi zero three, and then they, they went in another direction. But they did have a notion like this, so one might be curious if, if uh, these polishable equivalence relations are also uh, uniform in this sense, and this is the case. So if I have a Polish, uh, uh, a, a polishable equivalence relation as witnessed by V and gamma, so I have the uniformity and this group that witness, I can uh, make this uniformity bigger uh, so that it still witnesses polishability of E with, together with the same gamma and require that E is an element of the uniformity. So this E with V prime is a uniform equivalence relation. So actually, it's also, uh, this, this, this is part of this class. Okay, so we have these two larger classes. This is inside. But then uh, one would like to have smaller class, classes included in the, in the, in the polishable ones so that we know it's non-empty. There are some interesting concrete situations there, and there are two very important classes. So the first one is the orbit equivalence relation of Polish group actions. So I have, what's going on here is this is the standard definition. I have a Polish group acting continuously on a Polish space. And I look at the orbit equivalence relation. So I make two points equivalent if they are in, in the same orbit, or if one is moved to the other by an element of G. Right, so this is this element EA, where A is the action. A is the action here. So this is the, the standard definition, and this is a very important class. Now, there is a, so one has to guess, so if, if we want, we, our claim is that these equivalence uh, uh, relations are polishable. So one has to say what the uniformity is, one has to say what the group is, what the countable group is that witnesses it. 
Okay, so what is the uniformity? And this is something that you, if you just sit for, for, for a moment, you would, you would guess that uh, that should, should, should be right, the right thing. What I look at is this. I look at, let's look at this V hat. I look at an, a neighborhood, symmetric neighborhood of the identity. And I look at, so this is in the group. And I look at pairs of points x, y in the space such that x is moved to y by an element of this neighborhood of the identity. So this set is symmetric because here, if gx is y, then x is equal to g to the negative one y. And g to minus one y is also in v because v is symmetric. So that's a symmetric neighborhood. It contains the diagonal because identity is in v. So this is, this is something that wants to be in a uniformity. We just collect all those v hats and we close them upwards with respect to uh, symmetric sets. And one checks it's a uniformity. And for gamma A, we take the group of transformations that is induced by a countable dense subgroup of G. And then this orbit equivalent, the orbit equivalence relation EA is policiable as witnessed by this uniformity and, and gamma A. So I want to point out this, if this is an example people maybe are more familiar with. So if it, it's very important, these uniformities are very important. If I just look at, say, the topology generated by this uniformity VA, it's a very simple topology. What's the topology? So uh, on each orbit, what is the topology on an orbit? I take a point in the orbit, I take the stabilizer of the orbit, and then I take the quotient, uh, so my group is G, G divided by the stabilizer, so this would be G divided by the stabilizer. This is a Polish group, there is a, a canonical quotient topology here on the, on the quotient. It's not a group, but there is a topology here. This is a Polish topology, and there is a one-to-one -one map uh, from here to GX, one-to-one -one map. Uh, that's continuous. <coughs> this is a Polish topology. We just transfer this topology to, the, to, to GX, which makes the orbit GX uh, into, a, 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 into a Polish space. One checks that this topology doesn't depend on the choice of X in the orbit. That's easy. And uh, so the, what's the topology? So the topology on each orbit, I just put this quotient topology. And then the orbits are clope and subsets of the space. So the topology is just quotient topology on, on, on each orbit, and then there is no connection between the orbits. So, uh, but this, 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 is a, a, this, this picture will not, we have to remember the uniformity. To run, say, the, the Scott analysis, the uniformity is needed. If you just remember the topology, you have nothing. You, uh, so, um, so it's important that we remember this VA. There was some work done without mentioning VA by Becker and Kekris about VA. And for example, they prove a very nice result. This is not stated in terms of the uniformity. Uh, it's, it's sort of disguised a little bit, but they prove uh, that if the orbit equivalence relation on the, on the previous slide is Borel, then this uniformity has a Borel basis. So there is a basis uh, of the uniformity consisting of Borel subsets of the product. And it's actually even only if there is a Borel base, if there is a Borel basis, the equivalence relation is Borel. So it, 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 implicitly this uniformity showed up uh, in earlier work. Okay, so uh, now th th this was for me a, g a great discovery uh, made by other people. <laughs> so uh, I, I actually I had this because uh, I, I had I got, I got the I mean I made all these guesses about what the, the right the right thing should should here be and I could run this code analysis I knew that uh, I had this class of of Pol Polish uh, group actions there and then uh, I came across this paper by Benyakov, Doha, Nis, and Sankov where they look at is isomorphism. A relation on structures, but the structures come from continuous model theory. So if people, people are maybe familiar with this isomorphism equivalence relations coming from just the standard logics, uh, logic uh, where the metric is, is discrete, discrete uh, so first order logic. And in that, that situation, these are called uh, logic actions. And they are given, they are actually all given by Polish group actions. They are also actually all given by, these are as, as infinity actions, or closed subgroup of, of as infinity actions. Uh, so what they did, they generalize, and uh, Andre will talk about it today in the afternoon. They generalize this construction of, of, uh, of the space of isomorphism 
of structures to continuous model theory. And uh, very interesting, so, and they have very natural examples there. It's not some stuff that's made up. I mean, there are natural, natural examples. And uh, these equivalence relations are not given by Polish group actions. So in some cases, they can be reduced to uh, actions of Polish group. In some, some cases, it is unknown. But they are not given by Polish group actions. There is a, gr there is a group action around, but it doesn't give you the, the, the equivalence relation. So maybe I'll just go quickly over it. The, the construction is quite analogous to the construction from first order. Uh, logic, but there are very interesting uh, subtleties there. Something mostly have to do with what they call uh, modulus of continuity. So maybe we'll talk about it. So, uh, so what, what we have here is, let me just very quickly, you have a language as a countable language. One can assume it's only predicates. For every element in L, one associates with every element uh, and its arity. One associates a closed interval of the real line, and one associates a function so this, this P will be interpreted as a function from the structure to the real, uh, real line that will take values only in IP and it will be uniformly continuous uh, in the way this delta P tells it. So delta P is the uh, modulus of uniform continuity of P. So, the, so this is, some, this is uh, information that comes with the language. Uh, the language contains a distinguished binary symbol D, which is the metric, and the structure is a metric separable space where the symbol D is interpreted as a, as a metric, as, as the metric on the, on, the, on, the, on the metric space. Every P is interpreted as a function of appropriate arity uh, to the interval, and the DP is a modulus of continuity, of uniform continuity of PA. So these are structures for them, and many, many things are structures of this sort. Hilbert spaces, me measure spaces, uh, various types of uh, um, Banach, uh, Banach lattices, things like that. OK, and then they define uh, the space of all structures with respect to such a language. Essentially, what you do is you, uh, you take a point here. What this point will give you, it will give you, for every p, it will give you a structure, uh, a function from this little product here, uh, natural numbers to np to r. And you think of natural numbers as a dense subset in the structure that you are coding. Yes? So you have essentially the, what, what a point in Excel will give you is the trace of the structure that you are intending to code on a dense subset of this, on a countable dense subset of the structure. And you, this countable dense subset, uh, you identify it with natural numbers. OK? And then, so, OK, so then uh, x hat, I will denote by x hat the structure that at x codes, which is easily decoded from x. You just take some completions and, and, and you get it. Uh, OK, and then X, they check x of L is a, a G delta subspace of this Polish space. So it's a Polish space in its own right. And they make, uh, they look at EL. This is the isomorphic equivalence relation on XL. So two points, two codes here are equivalent when you look at the structures that they code and you ask, are they isomorphic or not? This is different from first order situations. So notice that there's this dense subset, natural numbers. If I had, so this is, for example, not given by an, it would seem maybe it's given by an S infinity action. Just because if I have an isomorphism from a X hat to Y hat, well, it can come from a isomorphically matching the dense subsets in X hat and in Y hat. But of course, there may be other isomorphisms. There will be isomorphisms that don't match the distinguished uh, dense subsets. And then you don't have this uh, matching implemented by an S-infinity action. But there is an S-infinity action. It just does not give you the equivalence relation. OK, and then one checks. So this takes some checking that the isomorphism equivalence relation EL is actually polishable. So these are, this is a separate class uh, of polishable equivalence relations. So one has to say what they, so the group is quite simple. To, so I need to, to witness it. I need the uniformity and the countable group. The countable group is I actually look at this S infinity action that does not give you the whole equivalence relation. I look at the countable uh, subgroup of it. That's my countable group. And then uniformity, one has to work a little bit. And then the proof is not completely one. It's a Schocke game argument. 
Okay, so there is this uh, second uh, important class. So now. Uh, oh. Metric structures are in the general setting of metric models. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm so, no, I didn't mean to say that. What you, in, yeah. let me tell you what you did. <laughs> you, you did introduce the Excel. Yeah. You did introduce Excel, and you did introduce, I guess this EL was your, your work. Yes? And then you did this code analysis. Yeah. I think, I, yes, maybe there is a little more there in the paper, right? I mean, there is this sort of fine analysis of these. Uh, Moduli of continu uniform continuity. In any case, but so, yes, of course. So this is the the whole setup is due to, I guess, Hanson and Benyakov, uh, continuous model theory. But what you isolated is this space X of L and the, the equivalence relation that comes with it. I'm sorry. Kiesler even did it. Oh really? Okay. Oh, you mean the, so it was Kiesler, Hanson, Benyakov? Yes. It's complicated, I know. I, I spent uh, time talking about it with Ward a lot, so I know. Okay, so Scott analysis. Scott analysis for, for so what is the Scott analysis? So uh, again, so this comes, so I want a, an algorithm, a procedure that will approximate my equivalence relation uh, by some simpler equivalence relation. And then I, I just make, it's very strange because I just make some guesses that, that then turn out to work. And they, uh, in concrete situations, they, they actually give what, what one produced before. So uh, if I have a subset, a, a symmetric subset of the product, there is a, and I have a topology, tau, on the space, there is a, a, a a simple procedure I can implement. What I can do is I can take vertical sections, take their closures, and look at this set. This is a, a fattening of my set that I started with. And I can do the same thing horizontally with the same topology. Take horizontal sections, closure, take the union, and then take the intersection of the two sets that are produced. This will be a fattening of the set A. So if you have a topology and a symmetric subset on the product, this is what you would do. I mean, this is you somehow you, this is an approximation of, this is sort of how much tau knows about A. This is some, uh, you just take the, the closures vertically, horizontally take the intersection. Okay, and then this lifts to an operation on, on uh, upward closed families of symmetric subsets of X cross X. If I take, I have a family, for example, a uniformity, I take a set A in the uniformity, I fatten it up, I look at A, a tau. And this gives me a family of symmetric subsets of X cross X. Since U was upwards closed, this family is actually included in you. It's a smaller family. So it gives me a poorer, for example, it will give me a poorer topology. So U tau, and this is my U tau. So if I have a uniformity and a topology, I'll produce a, 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 another uniformity, hopefully U tau. And then, so assume I have the situation that I have a, when I define my uh, equivalence relation. I have a topology, a uniformity, a group of transformations. Assume they are compatible. And then I, I just run the, this procedure. So what I, I have is I start with sigma. That's the topology that I have. And somewhere at infinity, I have the uniformity V that I want to approximate. Now I have a uniformity and a topology. So I can form V sigma. I can take this uniformity and approximate it using the topology by fattening the sets in them. This will give us, now I have a uniformity. So this will give, give me a topology, namely T of V sigma. But now again, I have a topology and a uniformity. So I can repeat that. This is my uh, uh, tau zero, this is my tau one. I can repeat it and look at V tau one. Uh, looking at this and this. And now this will produce a topology, T of V tau one. And I am again at this picture, and I just continue. 
And they just keep going at limit stages taking unions. Okay, so this is, this is what's going on here. I have, oh, I called them tau. Here they are called t, so it doesn't matter. So, at, uh, so if I have tau c, I produce u c by u, uh, taking v fattened by tau c, and then I add the new topology to the old topology that I produced. One can actually check, this is a definition, but I can actually check that these topologies, they all grow, and the uniformities also are becoming bigger and bigger. So uh, uh, denoting this tau xi and u xi, I'll denote them this by, uh, in this fashion because they are produced from sigma and v. Right, so this is a, a, this is a, a procedure that lets me, from sigma and v, lets me, uh, allows me to produce uniformities approximating from below V. So uh, containing sigma, and I'm enriching sigma, staying inside of V, and I'm approximating V. Okay, and then, uh, so the, one checks that these are, this, this requires some checking, that U C is a uniformity and all each type of tau C is a topology. So additionally, I have an equivalence relation. If I have an equivalence relation, so if I have an equivalence relation and a topology, you form a new equivalence relation. You, it's done a million times in descriptive set theory. So you take, uh, you make two points equivalent if, the if they belong to the closure, if take x and y, take the equivalence relation of x, equivalence relation of y, take their closure, ask if they are equal. If they are equal, make them equivalent. This is an equivalence relation containing E. So this is very crude normally, but it's only crude if the topology with which you take closures are crude. If you, are, if you are keep refining the topologies, these equivalence relations will become finer and finer. So uh, I produce this way, if I, I look, I produced in, on the previous slide these finer and finer topologies, and then I look at equivalence relations obtained from the one that's given in, in, in this fashion. So I get finer and finer approximations to E. Right, so I start with, my situation is this, I start with, I have E, and uh, topology, Polish topology and uniformity. Out of the Polish topology and the uniformity, I form finer topologies interpolating between sigma and the topology given by the uniformity. And then I take my equivalence relation and produce uh, uh, corresponding approximations to the equivalence relation. And my question is, okay, so I have these finer and finer approximations to E. The main question is, does it stop? Does it give me E? And at what stage? Okay, so this is the theorem. So this is the Scott analysis, general Scott analysis. I have a, a, a polishable equivalence relation on a Polish space. It's witnessed by V and sigma and gamma. Then, uh, no matter how what it is, how complicated it is, if I produce these, these approximations Xc, I will get E at the omega one stage. So at the, at I take the, I produce this Xc, this Xc is potentially produced for all ordinals, but, uh, at the level omega one, when I take the intersection of the first omega one many, I get my equivalence relation E. So, uh, but now, okay, this is fine, but now, uh, are these nice? I mean, in what sense are they nice? So for example, one thing is, is the, the main question is, do I stay in the same category? Don't I lose, it's, it would be horrible if I lost. So if E is polishable, it will, it, definitely all the Xs should be polishable. Because I, otherwise I would lose, and, but this is the case. So Xc, each of these Xcs that in, in approximates E is polishable as witnessed by the same gamma and the, and the uniformity that was produced on the, on the Xc's level. So one should say that even if I, if, so this is sort of something nice about this category of uh, polishable equivalence relations, even if you start with an equivalence relation that is given by a Polish group action, you run this, proce this procedure, you are not guaranteed that what you are getting in between are equivalence relations given by Polish group actions. They will be only polishable, so you get out of the category, but here you stay in. And then, okay, so they are nice in the sense that they are polishable, but now the question is, okay, uh, are, uh, the second point is they are not complicated. In the, in the Borel sense. So e, each Xc as an equivalent as a subset of the product with respect to this Polish topology, the initial Polish topology, is pi zero, essentially pi zero Xc. 
is pi zero xi is less than pi, it's iota of xi, I will say what iota of xi, one can compute it, iota of xi is less than xi plus omega, always less than xi plus omega. And uh, u xi also is, okay, so it's also witnessed by this u xi polishability. u xi is also a nice, uh, a nice uniformity, namely it has a basis consisting of sets that are pi zero iota of xi with respect to sigma cross sigma. So it also has, uh, uh, I control a basis, so a countable, there's a countable cofinal subset of the uniformity that is, uh, whose co complexity is controlled. And there's a bonus I get if the equivalence relation happened to be Borel, and this Borel on the C uh, of, of rank C, in this sense that it's in pi zero one plus gamma, where gamma is less than C, then I get E at the C stage. So it, it, it does behave like the, like the, like the uh, Xcode analysis in some way. So iota of xi, this is computed here direct, doesn't matter what it is, you have to, it's the, 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 the limit part of xi and the integer part of xi and you just have to multiply the integer part, part by two. Okay, so this is this, this is the Scott analysis, this is the, the theorem that uh, uh, it describes the Scott analysis. So the simple procedure that I, I described there gives you these approximating equivalence relations. All of them are polishable. They are simple, and uh, their uh, polishability is also uh, witnessed by simple uniformities. And you get uh, E at the omega stage, or if it's Borel, you get it at the countable stage. So that's the main theorem. So relationships with other Scott analysis, and this is, uh, this is half done. So I, I, I did, uh, uh, so I, I, let me just say what is done and then I will uh, have two questions. So relationship with polishability. So I had this, something that I, I didn't realize was a Scott analysis, but it was in the, in the following context. I looked at a, a, a Polish group H sigma, so it's a topological Polish group, a subgroup of, of it, G. And I always, one always looks, I mean, uh, when one looks at equivalence relations, at the orbit equivalence relation of the right action of G on X. So this is the right action here. So it's uh, sometimes it's called the coset equivalence relation. So I make two elements of H equivalent if they belong to the right coset, to the left coset of G. So this is this, uh, just divide the H by, into left cosets of G, and uh, you make the left cosets into, into equivalence classes. So this is the equivalence relation that people sometimes consider. And uh, a group, this is a definition due to Louvo, Kekris and Louvo, is polishable if there exists a Polish group topology on G, on this group, just a, forget about po polishable equivalence relation, uh, relations, just a topology on G that is a group topology on G, and that contains this topology on H restricted to G, right? So I have, I have uh, G here, subgroup of H. This comes with some sigma. There is a, this sigma can be restricted to G. It gives you some topology on G. It's a group topology, but it's not nice normally. There, but there is another topology here, a Polish group topology, that contains the restriction of sigma. So it's something like, if you look at the, all the uh, L1 convergent sequences of R to omega, and okay, L1 convergent sequences are a series. Uh, as a, sub, a subgroup are an F sigma subgroup of R2 omega, but of course it has a, a topology that it actually comes with, namely the L1 topology. And so this would be the topology tau that is, 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 uh, contains the one that it inherited from the product. So strong topology, weak topology. So these, are, these groups are called uh, polishable. This tau is unique. If it exists, it's unique like that. So it's some kind of an invariant of this G. So now, okay, so now this G actually acts on H, so this is a, an action of a Polish group, G taken with this topology tau, on a Polish space, a, a, a H sigma, and this is an orbit equivalence relation. So it's polishable, as we already saw, there's some, some witness to it, and we can write this, uh, what on the previous slide, we can produce the uniformities, we can pro produce the approximations, we can produce the topologies that come from the uniformity. So we can run this abstract Scott analysis in this concrete case. And then, so this abstract Scott analysis, you have uh, H, G inside, 
uh, uh, the, the, the Coulomb relations are, are, are uh, left uh, cosets, and then you have some approximating equivalence, abstract equivalence relations. They will be polishable, they will be, you will control their uh, Borel classes, but structurally you would expect more. You would expect uh, the following thing. So it, what, what happens is, so here I, I just, I will neglect, neglect writing this sigma VG because not to clutter notation. So I'll write it this way. It turns out that this Xi approximation, so this, this Xi approximation of this left coset equivalence relation is just an equivalence relation of, of on H abstractly. It's just an equivalence relation. But it turns out it's not just an equivalence relation. It turns out there is a subgroup of H, G, Xi, such that this approximation is the coset equivalence relation of the subgroup. So if I have, a, so I, I imagine this, there is this H here, and inside there is G. I have a G C sandwiched between G and H, such that the Xi's approximation to this, to the equivalence relation is actually the coset equivalence relation of G C. So actually, one recovers a, gr a group GC like that. And then it turns out this is a polishable group. G is a, with this topology tau Xi, to polishable in the sense of Kekri's Luvo. Uh, G, the initial group, is dense in it. Uh, at limit stages, you get, you just take intersections. So at limit stages, it's, it's this. At, and then one actually can, uh, can be very concrete on on the successor stages, when we go from GXC to GXC plus one, GXC plus one will be smaller than GXC. It will be pi zero three in GXC when GXC is taken with its natural Polish topology tau Xi. So when I make the jump, is a pi zero three jump. I may, don't make huge jumps. Each jump is a pi zero three jump. And moreover, as up to that restriction, this is the, the largest possible jump I make. Namely, if I have any pi zero three subsets that contains the original G. So I have this original G. I've got G C here and G C plus one inside. If I take a set containing the original G, Included in GC that is pi zero three, then it essentially contains the whole GC plus one. When restricted to GC plus one is commiger in the next topology. So I make my jumps are pi zero three jumps, but uh, as far as uh, uh, modulo that uh, restriction, they are as large as possible. And the last thing is that I do get if G is Borel, I, I get I get G as uh, at the Xis at, at the countable stage. So, one, so my, I, what is shown here is that this abstract analysis gives this sort of analysis. And in fact, this, this kind of analysis, I knew it existed because this is, I had this, the, this a theorem that produced these sort of groups for a polishable subgroup of H. So the abstract analysis gives the concrete thing in the, in the concrete situation. And this hope with E1, maybe it's, I mean, maybe it would come to nothing, but with E1 is that one uses this analysis to prove E1 dichotomy for, a, a, for a coset equivalence relations, Borel subgroup and Abelian. One runs a Scott analysis here on this side as far as one can. And then either one captures H, and then because it was captured in a Scott analysis, and captures G in a Scott analysis, it's polishable. So its idealis is everything. Or one has to work, if, or there is a failure, and then one flips and one embeds E1. So that's why this gives me hope that using this abstract analysis, one can push it further to broader classes. And then let me maybe go quickly. I just want to indicate that there were results earlier on. Uh, but if, if, I'm, I'm, I mean, as, as sure as one can be without actually proving it, that they will also, there are other Scott analysis, uh, one of, of Greg Horth and another one uh, from your paper. They also should coincide with this abstract one. So let me say here, Greg uh, did a Scott analysis for orbit equivalence, so uh, narrower class of, uh, of orbit equivalence relations of continuous actions of Polish groups. He produced equivalence relations it was getting the, the orbit equalization at the omega one stage. Uh, he controlled uh, on Borel, for Borel, he was getting them on a countable stage. He controlled 
the, 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 the complexity. Here is there is something that there is a discrepancy with what he was getting and what's, what's gotten in this uh, abstract situation. He was getting that each class, equivalence class, carries a topology, but it's not a Polish topology, but it contains a dense subset on which the topology is Polish. So this gives me a little pause that this might be something a little different, but I, I think maybe it's just uh, he maybe did not, not uh, didn't spend maybe did not check it carefully or uh, so this should actually be Polish here and his analysis uh, should give so the question is is Greg's analysis the same in this particular case of EA is it the same as the abstract analysis that I run here. So this is, the, the, the problem here is one just has to sit down. Both analyses are given by algorithms. One has to check that these algorithms, they are different algorithms and one has to check step by step that they are, they are the same. You see, in the previous slide, I checked that it gives the same, for, for coset equivalence relations, it was giving the same thing because uh, the abstract one is an algorithm, but the other one is a characterization. There is an abstract characterization. One just checked that the characterization holds. By here, one has to check it step by step. Let me maybe not spend too much time on this. I, we already talked about it. The, the Scott analysis for isomorphism equivalence relations in continuous model theory uh, due to Benyakov, Doha, Nies, and Tsankov. Of course, it's formulated in terms of Scott sentences and so forth, but one can extract from it um, uh, uniformities and, and the subgroup, so, uh, and equivalence, approximation equivalence relations, one should get, be getting the same thing. But uh, again, this needs to be checked. I am I'm almost positive that this will be true. So let me, last three uh, minutes, I think I have three minutes, I go an hour. Yeah. So uh, filtrations of topology, let me talk a little bit about the proof because this is kind of curious. I did not expect something like this to come up. So I, this is, I can forget everything that was, we've done so far. One just looks at topologies now. Topologies on a, on a set. One has two topologies, sigma and tau. And one has this notion of filtration going from one topology to another. So sigma is small, tau is big. A filtration is, is just an increasing sequence of topologies, starting with sigma and going, uh, approximating tau. But one restricts what one can do. These, these filtrations have the following property that, uh, okay, if one has, so if one has, If one has, uh, if I have a, a set A and it is closed with respect to uh, tau C. So it's, it shows up as a closed subset at the stage tau C. I continue with my filtration, I reach a stage alpha. And then at the very end I have my topology tau. It's somewhere at infinity. I, this, this, this is a simple set, it showed up at, at C. I would like to compute its interior. And then the filtration should be such that once I pass C, the topologies that I'm getting compute the interiors correctly in the sense that they compute them as, as if they were tau. So tau will make the interior as big as possible because tau has a lot of open sets. But the, if the set is simple at C, once I pass it, I know what the, interior, the interiors are, are. So these are, uh, I call them filtrations. So you can go to a subsequence of a filtration, still a filtration. But it's a filtration from, so it's an abstract definition. There is nothing to it. This is, this, that's all there is. So a filtration. And let me maybe not, let me, this is the theorem that's relevant. So the question is, I have filtrations. One can produce filtrations, trivial ones. There is a slowest filtration. Uh, so there's lots of filtrations from sigma to tau, and I produce this filtration. It goes up and up. Here is tau. So the big question is, is there a gap here? Do I, if I have a filtration, do I actually, uh, am I forced to reach tau? Under what conditions? And if I am forced, at what stage am I forced to reach tau? And then, so it turns out that what attracts filtration to tau is tau being bare. So tau being bare uh, attracts it. And what controls uh, <laughs> the stage at which they, 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 uh, they, they, they click, they connect, is you look at the basis of tau and you ask how complicated can it be with respect to sigma. 
is it consists of C, if it consists of C sets, they will click, but you don't control where. If the basis of tau is Borel with respect to sigma, they will also, there will be no gap, and you know where they will actually connect. So this has, looks like has nothing to do with, with the, what was going on uh, previously, but if you remember, we had these equivalence relations and topologies, in the, and we wanted them to converge to something in the limit. This is a similar idea, and this is what it used. So let me very quickly just, just explain this theorem. Two topologies, tau is regular and bare, alpha is uh, a limit ordinal, uh, omega one or countable, I have a filtration, and I assume that uh, elements of the filtration are completely metrizable, not necessarily separable. This, is, uh, this does not happen in, the, in applications. One has to have non-separability. Tau is completely metrizable for all elements of the filtration. If tau has a neighborhood basis consisting of, se of Borel sets of whose class I control, so tau, the one in the end, has a simple Borel basis with respect to this one. So it may be much bigger than sigma. Maybe this may be Polish separable, this may be non-separable, but there is a basis here that is on the level of alpha as far as Borel sets in sigma go. Then no matter how, how I produce this filtration, as long as the elements of the filtration are completely metrizable, I reach tau at the alpha's level. So if I go in this filtration past alpha to alpha plus one, actually tau is equal to tau alpha plus one. And uh, so this is what enters into, into, into the proof of this theorem. And here one can finesse a little bit. Completely metrizable is actually paracompact. Uh, I, I talked about it in Toronto and I was told that uh, I thought paracompact and uh, hereditarily bare and regular, it was essentially metrizable, but I was told it's not. So one can actually, it's a little more, uh, one can make it finer, but this is what, what is applied. Okay, I'm done, thanks. Uh, so this was for, you take G subgroup of H, this H is Polish, uh, and this G is Borel, and a billion, a little less than a billion, but a billion, let's say. And then it is the case that either E1, Borel, actually continuously, but Borel reduces to this, or uh, G is Polishable, in the sense of Kekris-Luvo. Uh, and this is proved by, I start with something Borel, and I simply try running the SCOD analysis. And I just, just try running it. And then there is a theorem, it's also true here, I didn't mention it, that if I know the class of this group, it's class alpha, if I run the SCOD analysis and I can go past alpha to alpha plus one, that at alpha stage, I must have hit G. There is a theorem like that. So I run this SCOD analysis as far as I can. If I went past the, the Borel level of G, G is polishable because it showed up in the SCOD analysis. And if I didn't, then there is a failure of the SCOD analysis. And this has to be analyzed, and it turns out E1 embeds them. So this is true here, but one would, this is sort of a narrow class. Yes, 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 yes. Not completely generally, but one would hope. Uh, so there is a theorem of Schellach that says, if I have a Borel equivalence relation, it's given by an, an action of a Borel group. It's a Borel, it's a Borel, there is a Borel group, an, uh, an action that gives me this equivalence relation. So if one requires that in this, this, maybe this action is continuous, then I would hope that this analysis should go through. So it's, it's this subclass, but it will be much bigger than this. Thank you.